What up guys, Hansi here and today I'm super excited because we're gonna finish the hidden door. If you haven't already seen the first part, go check that out and then let's get started. When we left off last time we barely put the doors on the rails, but the rails were still just lying on the floor. So the first thing we have to do today is to find a way to fix them to the floor. I decided to get two boards a little wider than the width of the sled and then I mounted them perpendicular to the wall. In between them I put two 1x2s, which is the base of the rails. To fix the copper tubes to the 2x1s I picked up some tube clamps, but because of Norway's lacking selection of hardware products I had to pick up some that were slightly too big for the copper tubes. To fix that I used some double sided tape on the inside to pad them, and then I made sure the spacing between the rails were right by fastening one of the rails, and then I moved the sled back and forth to get the other one in the right position. Since this is supposed to actually be a wall, I had to add some beams to the construction, so I have something to attach the sheets of particle board to. During this build I basically had to redo the entire basement. But I'll only focus on the door part during this video, else we could spend another two episodes on this one, and I bet you don't want that. Anyway, Martina has given me a helping hand, which has made things a lot easier. So back to the door mechanism. The left to the right movement of the door will be driven by a threaded rod, which will also be attached to the rails. To support it and to lift it up to match the height of the cart, I am building two sockets out of some short pieces of 2x2. Two to let the rods rotate, I am making space for some large ball bearings. I got these in a nearby car parts store, but I will include links to all parts in the description, so you can buy them online if you get inspired to do something similar. In case the threaded rod manages to push its way through the wood, I am adding some metal plates to the back. There's not going to be much stress on the wood, so I don't think I really need them, but it's better to be on the safe side, so I added them anyway. I drilled in some screws with space around them to hold the bearings in place, as my hole was too crudely drilled out to hold them in place alone. A better craftsman would have made this look a lot nicer, but this works. Before putting the threaded rod through the cart and into the sockets, I made sure to attach the pulley wheel that we'll need later. Again, I'll have the links in the description. To drive the threaded rod through the door, I simply attach the end of it to my drill. Once it is through the entire cart, I can put it back on the rails. Then I attach the rail supports on the ends, and I just fasten them using some steel brackets on the side. To move the door from one side to the other, we are going to use this DC motor. It runs at 12 volts and uses maximum 30 amps. So to be able to run this motor, we are going to use this power supply. This is a 12 volt power supply and it can produce 30 amps. To be able to adjust the rotation of the motor so that it can move both forwards and backwards, we have to use this motor driver. To change the direction of the motor, we have this three position switch, which we are going to replace with another three position switch. And this is simply because this one is a permanent switch. So when you click it, it's going to stay in that position. But this one is a momentary switch. so. When I trigger it, it will immediately go back to the off position. Instead of doing all this in the wine cellar, we're gonna mount all our electronics to this MDF board. And when it's done, we can just take it and install it into the wine cellar. Before I fastened anything, I put all the components down to get an idea of where to place them. I decided to use some nylon spacers to give the power supply and the motor drivers some air between them and the MDF. They fit directly into the holes that were already there, so I just put enough of them in place so it would remain stable. While holding the components where I wanted them to go, I marked off the position of the nylon screws and drilled holes in the marked position. Then it was very easy to put the MDF on top of the power supply and fasten it using some M3 screws. I repeated this process for both the motor controllers as well. I didn't want to remove the potentiometers that controls the speed, because they might be handy to have if I do any adjustments later. To make them fit a little more seamlessly on the MDF, I traced their outline and then I picked up a router bit for my Dremel. Using this I carved out enough material so I could drop the potentiometers in and make them stay there with some hot glue. Before doing any of the necessary wiring, it's important to acknowledge that we're dealing with mains power and we need to do certain precautions. 
To me, these terminals look really exposed and easy to accidentally touch. With this in mind, I went to the website Thingiverse and found a cover that had the measurement that seemingly matched my power supply perfectly. I'll be printing this cover on my new Creality CR10 printer. I will probably talk more about this one in a separate video later, but it's really just been an amazing printer to me. From the minute I opened the box until I started the first print, it only took me about 20 minutes. And it has been printing good prints for about a month now, without needing any extra adjustments. I'm not sponsored by this brand or anything, I just really like the printer. So I'll have an affiliate link to it in the description if you want to buy it and support this channel at the same time, without any extra cost to you. With the cover finished, I could hook up the wires. I used some cable shoes to attach them to the terminals of the power supply. The cables I originally went with for the power supply was a little bit thin for 30 amps. So I went back and changed it to the black and red wire you can see here, which is a lot thicker and won't get warm even when drawing a lot of power. To keep things tidy I used some hot glue to hold the wires in place. After hooking up the mains power and both the motor controllers, it's time to move back into the wine cellar. Before placing the board with all the electronics, I put the motor bracket in place, as that will be tricky to do afterwards. This bracket attaches to the motor, and I wanted the motor to drive the threaded rod close to the end of the rod. I placed all the electronic easily accessible on the wall, and I will be looking to make an enclosure for this in the future, as I think it's a little bit exposed now, even while being on the hidden side of the door. I used some cable shoes again to attach the wires to the motor and seal the connection with some shrinking tubes. I then attached the motor to the bracket with some short flathead screws. After having everything in place, I simply connected the motor to the motor driver. It's important to double check the polarity before connecting anything though, as reversing it might damage the electronics. So now it's time to hook up the pulley belt, and I was expecting this to be one of the more challenging parts of this build, as I had no clue on how I could join it together to create a loop. Luckily this doesn't need the precision of a 3D printer, so a little overlap doesn't really matter. After cutting it to the right length, I decided to try to sew them together and then attach it to the motor. Here you can see me sitting hopefully on the floor for the first test, and it ran about 10 centimeters before snapping. But after creating a new one, reinforced with some super glue and a few more stitches, it actually worked. I know what you're gonna say though, that sounds stupidly weak. But I have stress tested it and I had it running back and forth quite a lot the last week. And it shows no signs of wear and tear yet. Anyway, it's not a foolproof method, so suggestions on how to do this better are welcome. After all of that was in place, all I had to do was hook up the wire from the linear actuator. To prevent it from being in the way and on the tracks, I kept it elevated with some larger wire clamps, making sure it had plenty of space to move. And now the electronics are basically done. All we need to do is add a trigger mechanism in the end. So the next focus is wrapping this up in a wall-like facade, so it doesn't look too obvious. First, I fastened the wall sheets in front of the door, and went to the back side of the wall and traced the entire door on the wall sheets. Then I took the wall down again and used the jigsaw to very roughly cut out the shape of the door. When everything was cut out, I reattached the two pieces of the wall sheets that now have a huge hole in them. The trickiest part with this was putting the door in place so it would be free to move past the edges of the wall. To lift it up I had it resting on a couple of nails and then I used my nail gun to stick it in place permanently. I couldn't get it in perfectly, but with a hand planer and a file it didn't take much time to get it right. The observant viewer might have thought that this is a little bit front heavy, and that's true. So to counterweight I stole a couple of cobblestones from our driveway and attached it with some strips. It doesn't look super intelligent, but they were the best counterweights I could think of. So now with all the major issues solved, we can see it in action for the first time. And it may seem like a tiny accomplishment and a silly thing to be proud of, but this is one of the more complicated practical things I have ever done, so I was very satisfied that it worked this well. I proceeded by dressing up the rest of the room and putting in some spackle where it was necessary. Martina helped me paint the entire room, which sped up the process a lot. 
adding the baseboards really just feels so satisfying. But in this room we decided to create a recurring pattern of baseboard on all the walls. This is to hide the edges of the secret door when it's closed. I had some different ideas on how we could do this, but I ended up creating frame-like sections around the entire room. When it was done, it actually didn't look too bad, so I was pretty happy with that. The trigger mechanism is going to be hidden behind one of the wine box plagues that decorates the wall. I hadn't decided on how I should do the trigger mechanism when we put the wall up. I thought I would run the cables behind the baseboard, but running them behind the wall just seems a lot more practical. Luckily, no studs were placed where I need them to go, so I drilled a hole in the wall of the hidden room, and then I used the jigsaw to create a square on the front wall. I soldered the three position switch to three long wires and pushed them from one hole to the other. To make it easy to operate, I fastened the switches on a thin piece of wood and then I hot glued it in place just in case I ever need to take it out again. So the wine box plate on the wall is going to be attached using some hinges, so it can easily be lifted up and down to access the control panel to open and close the door. And I do have a similar set of switches on the other side of the door so that it can be opened and closed from the inside, which I think is really important for a secret door. After reinserting all the wine racks and putting the bottles in them, it's time for the final demo. This has been a long build and it's taken a lot of time. So is the door practical? Probably not because it's a little bit slow if you need to use it frequently. And is it durable? Well I think it will last a while, if anything breaks it's the timing belt and this one is really easy to replace. But nonetheless I think it's super cool and it is really hidden and there's no way to see that there's a door here. If there was anything that I wanted to change, it's the trigger mechanism because it's not that cool and it would be really awesome to have it operated by an Arduino or something like that, but there simply wasn't enough time for this build. This video was made possible by our patrons on Patreon. If you like these kind of complicated projects and would like to see more of them, then please consider supporting us on Patreon, as they take a lot of time and resources to create. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.